Here where I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. My name is Ton de Goeie. I will be the pro-rector of this ceremony. And first of all, I welcome uh, Mr. Lambertus Marie Verheijen. He will defend his thesis in public, and the thesis is entitled The Ubiquitin Protease, Proteasome System in Neurodegenerative Diseases, Lessons from Mutant Ubiquitin. Um, welcome to all members of the degree committee, not only here in the aula, but also online. And in particular, I would uh, welcome, um, well, the two supervisors, of which one supervisor is here, Professor Harry Steinbusch. He's a professor of cellular and translational neuroscience at Maastricht University. And unfortunately, uh, the co-promoter, Professor David Hopkins, is not able to join us today here in the degree committee. And Professor Hopkins is Professor of Anatomy of the Nervous System at Dalhousie University in Halifax in Canada. I will introduce the uh, five opponents during the ceremony, during the opposition. Welcome to uh, all who are present here in the aula, and I welcome all uh, followers of the live stream. Um, Mr. Verheijen, may I ask you to uh, uh, present a summary of your thesis and I wish you success in the coming hour. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Prorector, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Corona. I'd like to share with you some highlights from my thesis and discuss their implications at large. Um, as you can tell from the title, the topic is about the ubiquitin system in neurodegenerative disease and specifically what we can learn from a mutant ubiquitin. Now to give you a brief overview of my talk, I will first explain to you very briefly what ubiquitin and the ubiquitin system are. Next, I will uh, tell you about the role of a mutant ubiquitin in specifically Alzheimer's disease. And then I will discuss some highlights from my thesis uh, by means of a couple of innovations that I think my thesis uh, brings forward. Now I'll try to briefly summarize the main findings again. Now, what is ubiquitin? Ubiquitin is a small uh, molecule that acts as a modifier of other molecules and basically determines the fate of other proteins in the cell. It acts sort of as a glue uh, that specifically binds to proteins. And what are proteins? Proteins are basically the workhorses of our cell, and they control multiple basic functions in our cells. So they are the structural support, structural building blocks of cells. They can act as molecular motors that transport around other molecules to the cell, uh, and they can act as catalysts of certain biochemical reactions, as enzymes, for example. Now here you see an example a schematic of a, of a protein. Uh, but in our bodies, proteins are constantly exposed to all kinds of stressors. Uh, you could, for example, think of heat stress that can damage a protein, but also in our bodies, proteins can be exposed to uh, an oxygen molecule, an oxygen radical that goes sit on top of a protein and causes a conformational change, basically damaging it. So that's that little bend structure you see over here. Now, uh, fortunately, our body uh, has certain repair mechanisms to deal with these kind of damaged proteins. Uh, like molecular chaperones that can help refold uh, the protein to its native state. Uh, but that's not always possible. And if these mutant abnormal or abnormal proteins would stick around, we would be in a, in a world of trouble uh, because they cannot f carry out their normal functions anymore. And fortunately, uh, life has evolved uh, uh, mechanisms to do away with these harmful damaged proteins. Uh, and one a primary signaling factor for doing away with these proteins is this molecule ubiquitin. And you see that here. Once you have uh, a, a damaged protein, it's a little band structure, through a process called ubiquitination, this molecular glue, this ubiquitin, can become conjugated to this abnormal protein and sort of acts as a def tag uh, for these molecules. Because once these molecules have been, these proteins have been tagged, they will be signaled for destruction by the proteasome. And you see that schematically here. The proteasome is this big intracellular machine that acts as a molecular shredder, or sort of a meat grinder, that chops up these tagged proteins into little uh, bits. And now how does this tie in with neurodegenerative disease? Here on top you see two pictures. In the top panel you see a, a healthy brain from a normal, from a healthy person, neurotypical person. And in the bottom you see 
uh, the brain, postmortem brain of a, of a Alzheimer's disease patient. And what's obvious is that it's a lot smaller and you see all these grooves in the brain. So there's a lot of uh, atrophy going on. And when you look into sections of this Alzheimer's brain, so you cut it up and look at it under a microscope, you can see this characteristic protein aggregate structure. So on the left you see uh, these uh, A beta, A beta plugs. Uh, and on the right, you see these structures which are called neurofibrillary tangles. And these are made up of the type of abnormal proteins that I just showed uh, schematically. And interestingly, to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's as compared to other neurological disorders can be highly heterogeneous. Virtually all of these disease cases, they present with these abnormal protein aggregates. And interestingly, most of these protein aggregates are frequently highly ubiquitinated, which means that probably our cells have a problem of doing away with these proteins as a clearance uh, issue. And further, there's inherited mutations uh, that also cause neurodegenerative diseases, uh, which shows a causal connection between the ubiquitin system and uh, uh, neurological disease. Now, perhaps the most compelling evidence for the involvement of the ubiquitin system in neurodegeneration came from work by the late Fred van Leeuwen in the 1990s. And he discovered through a mechanism called molecular misreading, which I won't explain in detail right now, how a mutant variant of ubiquitin can arise. And this is the only known naturally occurring uh, mutant ubiquitin. And here on the left side, you see schematically what a normal protein would look like. There's this green line over here. But through this mechanism, uh, mutant proteins can arise that have this abnormal uh, C-terminus. And the C-terminus, this uh, structure at the end, this little red uh, line over here, uh, cannot fulfill, causes ubiquitin to not carry out its normal function anymore. So it cannot conjugate these protein substrates for degradation. And here on the right side, you see a, a panel uh, with a section of an Alzheimer's brain again. And in black, you see a staining, a so-called immunostaining, in which this mutant ubiquitin molecule has been visualized. And we see that this mutant ubiquitin accumulates specifically in Alzheimer's disease uh, patients. Now, to study or understand the role of this mutant ubiquitin in disease further, transgenic animals uh, were generated. Uh, mice that specifically express this abnormal ubiquitin molecule. Uh, and here you see in the top panel a sagittal section of a mouse brain, so sections were made, and you look at it from the lateral side, and you see in this in dark or in purple, you see structures that are positive for this mutant ubiquitin, uh, so this ubiqui mutant ubiquitin expression at high levels. At the bottom you see again a section from this animal, this time a coronal section, so you look at it from the front. Uh, and tissue was isolated and chemically processed uh, to measure proteasome activity, so the activity of this meat grinder I showed before. And it was found that this mutant ubiquitin, sort of as expected, results in a lower proteasome activity as compared to healthy animals. In addition, these mice show various phenotypes that are associated or compatible with neurodegenerative disease. So they show memory deficits in behavioral tasks, for example. Now I come to the first uh, innovation of the thesis, which was to provide a mapping of uh, mutant ubiquitin expression in this mouse model and to compare it uh, with the expression of mutant ubiquitin in Alzheimer's disease patient uh, brains. So here again, you see such a sagittal uh, sections with these UBB plus one, these mutant ubiquitin positive structures. And I will highlight two of them, the olfactory bulb and uh, the brainstem area. These are neuroanatomical regions of increasing interest in, in Alzheimer's disease. And that's because uh, they're also functionally uh, implicated in these disease. So the olfactory bulb, it's an olfactory region associated with smell, and it appears that in Alzheimer's patients there's early on already olfactory uh, problems. And the brainstem is involved in autonomous control of respiratory and swallowing behavior, which are, for example, the ultimate cause of death of most uh, Alzheimer's patients. Now, we looked at uh, this mouse anatomy, and then we wanted to compare this uh, expression pattern to expression of mutant ubiquitin in Alzheimer's disease patient brains. So here you see, again, different sections. And besides, like indicated on the right, the neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques you usually see, we do indeed find these mutant ubiquitin positive structures in the olfactory region, uh, and also in the brainstem. Here you see a cross-section of uh, a brainstem from this mouse model, 
and you find high expression of mutant ubiquitin in the structure called the parabrachial nucleus, uh, specifically the lateral uh, parts. And we do see expression of this mutant ubiquitin also in comparable regions in Alzheimer's disease patient uh, brains. And in addition, we see that these, mouse, these mutant mice, they show behavioral uh, and functional uh, deficits that are compatible with this uh, staining pattern. So they show breathing or respiratory uh, control uh, dysfunction. And next, and I think very importantly, we wanted to find out whether this mutant ubiquitin molecule also has an effect on other uh, protein pathology uh, in uh, animals. So we wanted to see here specifically what the effect of mutant ubiquitin on this amyloid beta pathology was. So what we did is we crossed uh, ABP PS1 mice. That's a mouse model for a beta amyloidosis that makes these amyloid plaques. And here you see on the right brain sections from a wild type uh, brain, where there's no staining in black or purple here. But on the far left, you see a brain section from this APP PS1 mice, and it's full of these amyloid uh, plaques, and they accumulate with age. And when we crossbred this mouse model with our UBB plus one mutant mice, we kind of unexpectedly uh, saw that there was an age-dependent decrease in amyloid plaque load in these animals. And also, as you can see in the bar graphs uh, on the bottom, the levels of soluble A-beta, so the molecules, the abnormal molecules that make up these plaques, they also are reduced with age in the uh, crossbred mice. And the mechanism for this is still kind of unclear, uh, but a recent evidence shows that uh, UBB plus one, chronic low levels of UBB plus one, can actually have a, a protective effect to a sort of adaptive proteostasis uh, mechanism. So low levels of this UBB plus one, they can actually compensate to activating other proteostasis routes, like these molecular chaperones that I showed before, uh, and also uh, lysosomal uh, pathways. And lastly, we were interested to find out whether this mutant ubiquitin can also be detected in other brain disorders besides Alzheimer's. Uh, previous work has already shown that there's other disorders like Huntington's disease in which this mutant ubiquitin accumulates. I was specifically interested in this disease called ALS PDC, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis Parkinsonism dementia. Uh, and that's a disease found at high incidence in a certain geographic part of the world, thought to have an environmental uh, etiology. Um, uh, and there we indeed uh, found that this mutant ubiquitin was also present together with other uh, UPS components. Um, and the reason of why we were specifically interested, or I was specifically interested in this disease, is because this is a so-called multi-proteinopathy. So besides plaques and tangles that are characteristics of Alzheimer's, they show many other types of abnormal protein pathology. Uh, here you see a protein called TDP43 that's specifically associated with ALS or motor neuron disease. And I won't cover this in too much detail because it's quite technical, but also here we were interested to find out whether this mutant ubiquitin could affect the aggregation and toxicity of this TDP43. And we sort of found the same thing as for the amyloid beta pathology I showed before, that depending on the context, uh, you can actually have a protective effect to chronic expression of this mutant ubiquitin. Uh, and with that, I'd uh, like to summarize uh, the main findings of the thesis. We showed that mutant ubiquitin can be used as a marker to identify neuroanatomic regions associated with neurodegenerative disease. Uh, we showed that it can be used as a probe to identify UPS deficits in <coughs> other neurodegenerative diseases, like this ALS PDC syndrome, uh, and that we can use this mutant ubiquitin as a tool uh, to study the role of the ubiquitin system in neurodegenerative disease. And I think that's something that is a highly uh, underexplored uh, uh, use of this mutant ubiquitin molecule. And with that, I'd like to end and thank you for your attention. And I'd like to give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Verhey, for your clear summary of your thesis. The opposition. Uh, will be opened by uh, Professor Reutlingsberger. He is Professor of Biochemistry of Apoptosis at Maastricht University. Professor Reutlingsberger. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, I, I would like to start my, uh, my opposition with uh, congratulating you with this uh, excellent piece of work. Uh, I, I enjoyed reading it. 
I'm a biochemist and I learned a lot about uh, biochemistry now in in uh, protein uh, proteostasis and the meaning to neurodegeneration. I would also like to give the compliments uh, to your uh, promotion team because uh, they supported uh, part of this, I think. And uh, what I would like to uh, discuss with you is uh, central in your uh, thesis is the ubiquitin, you nicely explained in your uh, presentation here. And um, the uh, mutant, the UBB plus one, is derived from what you call a molecular misreading. And that was, I, I now learned, uh, first described by uh, uh, Van Leeuwen. Yes. Um, it reminds me of, this process reminds me of a stochastic process that can happen in, in every cell. Reading your thesis, and especially chapter four and chapter five, but also all your discussions, uh, it came into my mind that maybe it's not a stochastic process, but a regulated process, and that UBB plus one has a physiological function and not a pathological. What is your idea about this? I would like to discuss this with you. Well, highly esteemed opponent. Uh, that's an excellent point, because uh, this, this process of molecular misreading is definitely a stochastic process, and it's a so-called uh, transcript error. And this refers to a field in which mutations that are not present in DNA can become introduced into RNA molecules, ultimately yeah. resulting in mutant uh, proteins. And there's multiple ways in which this mechanism could occur. So this molecular misreading of the mutant ubiquitin uh, specifically takes place at these dinucleotide repeat motifs. Yeah. And we've recently, that's work that's not described in the thesis, uh, developed assays to specifically measure this. This is called circular consensus sequencing. And we indeed find that all cells we evaluated from all kinds of different organisms, that these monotonic repeat motifs are highly slippery. Uh, so this occurs all the time, constantly. Uh, so we have measurements that show that this mutant RNA molecule is generated all the time, independent of disease state, independent of age. So it's not a stochastic process, probably. Well, the, the errors, they occur constantly in a, in a sort of random nature. But of course, the errors occur at much higher frequencies as these monotonic repeat motifs than at other parts of the genome. But, but, but you call it an error. Now we, we are entering philosophical fields. You call it an error, but I'm, I call it, uh, it's meant to be. Well, so it has a physiological significance. Based on the things we see, uh, this protective effect, for example, when it's expressed at low levels, uh, could indicate a physiological function for these specific molecules. Um, it's sort of also dependent on uh, dosage levels. It's not something I talk about extensively, also not in the thesis, uh, but different transgenic mice were generated, for example, yeah. and you see that when it's expressed at very low levels, it's actually completely cleared from the brain. But once you start in putting, putting in additional copies of the transgene on the different promoters, you see that there's a clearance problem of this mutant ubiquitin itself. Yeah. So probably there's a highly dosage-dependent uh, effect of this mutant ubiquitin. And, <coughs> and there, probably, the ratio of the, the mutant and the wild-type ubiquitin plays a role. Yeah, this is something you did not measure, eh? the, the well, level of the wild-type uh, ubiquitin in your uh, thesis. We did also do, I'm not sure if there's data are in there, but we also did constantly measurements of the wild type ubiquitin levels. Okay. And we see those are not really changed in the mutant ubiquitin condition. Of course, UBB or ubiquitin itself is also highly stress inducible. Uh, but we see, for example, in the crossbred mice, that there's no difference in uh, wild type ubiquitin yep. levels. We also did these experiments in uh, <coughs> human uh, neurons recently. Uh, and there we see that. UBB plus one itself is sufficient to induce different kinds of protein pathology. Actually, I actually have a slide uh, on that as well. Uh, so we express this mutant ubiquitin in uh, human IPS-derived neurons. Yeah. And we find that uh, the mutant ubiquitin, in the absence of any genetic risk factors, so like familial Alzheimer's mutations, which are causal for the disease, is sufficient to induce blocks and tangles in the human uh, neuronal models. Uh, and also there we see that there's a ubiquitin-dependent effect in the previous uh, 
slide in these yeast systems. We also did this in, in the human cells. Uh, we see that the effect of UBB plus one is highly context dependent. Uh, so here on the top, yeah. for example, this is this yeah. delta. So, so that, that brings me to, uh, to another point I would like to discuss with you, and that is in your thesis. You, uh, you assume or uh, you uh, propose that the uh, uh, UBB plus one and the UPS uh, may have a cause, causal effect on, on, the, uh, on the disease. Mm -hmm. And I'm now thinking, is it? Is, is it really a cause for the disease or one of the causes for the disease, disease or is it a consequence of the disease? Well, that has been a discussion for a very long time. Like we see this UBB plus one molecules in Alzheimer's brain, even at very early stages of pathology. A nice thing with these diseases like Alzheimer's is you can very accurately stage them pathologically and uh, predict its progression uh, uh, pathologically. And we see that this mutant ubiquitin is present at very early stages, BRAC0 stages. Yeah. But the discussion always was like, well, is it a cause or consequence? Because the earliest intraneuronal A-beta pathology yeah. also is present very early on the disease. Uh, but we think that by doing these functional experiments, <coughs> and of course this still is a model, uh, but if you express this mutant ubiquitin in human neurons which are free of pathology and you can induce the pathology by putting in this mutant ubiquitin, there must be a causal uh, connection. Oh, okay. Uh, well, well, that's an artificial disturbance of the balance. Yes, it is. Huh? So not necessarily means that it is a cause in uh, pathogenesis uh, in, in human. But uh, let's assume that, that it is a cause of disease. And, and uh, you told us that uh, this molecular misreading happens in every cell type then I would think that uh, in those patients where obviously uh, the balance is disturbed and you have a, an, an overexpression of the UBV plus one in, in the brain, it will also be overexpressed in all the other organs. Let's say, for example, the heart, which uh, has also uh, post-mitotic uh, cells. Have you seen any, any uh, uh, aberrations in your mouse model at the cardiac level and, and in patients with Alzheimer, do they have cardiac problems? Uh, no, that's an excellent point because also in humans, we see in certain patients with muscle pathologies or cardiac amyloidosis, yeah. we have found the mutant ubiquitin uh, molecule. Uh, we couldn't evaluate this in the mouse model because we use neur neuron specific promoters. So here, a uh, ChemK2 alpha oh, yeah. promoter yeah, was yeah, used. And uh, also other promoters we used, but they were all neuronal specific. So there was a Thai 1 2 promoter, and this was a ChemK2 yeah. alpha promoter. Uh, but we don't have a pan uh, cellular expression in a, in a mouse model yeah. for UB plus 1. Have, have, you, have you or anybody else ever looked at the UBB plus 1 expression in, in uh, biopsies of patients with cardiomyopathies? Uh, not specifically cardiomyopathies. I think the only cardi there was only cardiac amyloidosis that was checked. Uh, we do see it in some other muscle, but like other postmitotic tissues, as you actually point out, yeah. but not uh, for other types of cardiomyopathy specifically. Okay. Either. Is that something uh, to do in the future? Uh, I Would definitely you think, think this so. is relevant? Of course, yeah, of course, there's, there's many uh, types of muscle pathologies in particular uh, uh, that could suffer from this. There's definitely UPS impairments in these uh, patient tissues. So yes, UBB plus one could definitely play a role there as okay. well. Thank you. I'm very happy with your answers. I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you, Professor Reutlingsberger. Uh, the next opponent is Professor Jochen Walter. He's Professor of Molecular Neurology at the University of Bonn in Germany. Yeah, the uh, candidate. I would also like to thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation and also this great piece of work here in the thesis. I really enjoyed very much uh, reading it. And um, I uh, also have some questions. Um, a very specific one, probably in the beginning. Um, you used a, a specific APP, PS1 transgenic mouse model to study the effect of UBB plus one uh, on amyloid uh, plug load and also on uh, secretase activities. So the question is, 
is there any specific reason why you uh, use this APP PS1 Delta Exon 9 double transgenic mice? Uh, because you also looked on the level of um, PS1 n terminal fragments uh, and you found some, some effect of the UPP plus one, uh, probably reinstalling somehow the levels of uh, resonilin, which, which is a, a component of the gamma sequitase complex. So yeah, why, why do you use specifically this model and uh, how do you explain the effect on gamma sequitase uh, levels or present levels uh, in particular. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, we use this specific amyloidosis mouse model because it develops amyloid pathology early on in life. So already from about four to six months, you find the first black pathology. So it was an easy readout uh, to determine the effect of the mutant ubiquitin on plaque pathology. Uh, also, we use this model, uh, even though it expresses two familial AD mutations, it's a relatively uh, compact model in the sense that there's only two mutations. There's also other AD mice, as you're well aware, for example, the 5X FAD mice. Uh, but we specifically didn't want to use those mice because it would be very hard, we thought, to disentangle uh, any kind of pathological change we saw there. Uh, and here we specifically know quite well for these specific mutations how they affect uh, amyloid generation. Uh, uh, we have a relatively fast development of pathology, so we could measure effects without aging them beyond nine months or so, although we did that. Um, so I think, I think the main reason of why this was a good model to use is its fast development of block pathology. Mm. And uh, then why did you analyze the levels of... Uh in one N-terminal fragment in these mutant mice as an indicator for, for gamma sequitase levels or? Because what we saw in these mice was this kind of unexpected decrease in plug load and amyloid beta yeah. levels. Uh, and we wanted to figure out what the mechanism for this was. And we thought that one of the mechanisms could be found in the generation of uh, A-beta. Uh, from APP. So what we did first is do biochemical measurements of different secretase activities. So we isolate, isolated membrane fractions from uh, uh, brain tissue from these mice and did secretase activity uh, measurements. And what we saw is that in the crossbred mice, so the APP PS1, uh, UBB plus 1 crossbreed, uh, we found that there was a mild but consistent increase in gamma secretase. It shows a decrease in gamma secretase activity as compared to wild type, we saw that there was a certain rescue in gamma secretase activity in the, in the crossbred mouse. And that's why we wanted to look at different components of the gamma secretase complex, because we thought, and has been described in literature, that certain components can be degraded, can be degraded by the, be degraded by the, degraded by the proteasome. So we wanted to check levels of different gamma secretase components. We looked at persinolins, we looked at uh, nicastrin and other components that are not essential. Uh, and we found that uh, the only component that was changed were these fragments of uh, persinolin. And in the wild type, in the APP PS1 mice, there's still uh, wild type copies, like the native copies of the persinolin present. So these persinolin fragments will still be turned over and we found that in the crossbred animals, there was an increase in these persinolin delta, uh, or in the persinolin wild type and terminal fragments. And we think that in part explains the rescue effect on the gamma secretase activity. But would be the, the trans gene you expressed, the PS1 delta exon 9, also contribute to the PS1 and terminal fragments you detect? Um, well, the, the exon 9 variant, the delta exon 9 variant, cannot be proteolytically cleaved. So there's auto uh, or endoproteolysis of the uh, persinolin uh, molecule. And it doesn't occur on the delta exon 9 variants. So the fragments we see, they must be derived from the wild type uh, copies that are still present. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, you, you also speculate in, in the discussion to this uh, chapter four about the role of UBB plus one. 
uh, in the generation of uh, longer a beta species, and, and you include somehow the APP C terminal fragment also as a longer uh, a beta species. Uh, and you also talk about long oligomers. Uh, can you elaborate a bit what uh, why you include the APP C terminal fragments into a beta uh, spectrum and um, also what you understand of long oligomers? Uh, yes. So we also specifically measured APPC terminal fragments in this mouse model. And also there, we saw that there was an effect of UV plus one expression on the C terminal fragments. And as you will know, the C terminal fragments, the C99 fragments primarily, they're the basis for these long A beta uh, oligomers. They just get cleaved differently by the gamma secretase. Uh, and why I wanted to mention this specifically is because there's well, I wanted to say emerging evidence, but I think there's a lot of proof now that actually not the plasma membrane is the primary site of A beta generation, uh, like has been the textbook example. I think more and more evidence suggests, well, both genetic evidence and cell biological work, suggests that most A beta, long A beta, that would be both the oligomers and the C terminal fragments, are generated at the sites of intraneuronal organelles and primarily endosomes. Uh, reason of why we specifically wanted to measure the APPC terminal fragments is also because we see that there's high levels of toxicity of the C terminal fragment when you express it in neuronal models. Uh, and I think both endolysosomal processing and retromer dependent trafficking of APP will become the dominating uh, mechanisms for APP generation in Alzheimer's studies. I think the previous or prevailing view that APP is primarily cleaved from the plasma membrane of neurons is incorrect, or at least it's not the primary factor in generating uh, A-beta molecules. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yep. It, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, but this brings me to the, to the next question, if there is uh, time, as you mentioned, uh, Probably endolysosomal system is important component in, in disease uh, etiology. And uh, what is known, I, I think you, you wrote in the thesis a bit that uh, the overexpression or the generation of UBB plus one also affects other degradation pathways, uh, maybe lysosomal activity or, or autophagy. So did you also analyze, uh, let's say, the activity of this other degradation pathways, how they are affected by UBB plus one? This is, an, uh, this is a very obvious point from the adaptive proteostasis point of view. So if the mutant ubiquitin can also uh, reroute uh, abnormal substrates or protein substrates to other degradation pathways, that might explain this rescue effect by crossbreeding these animals to UBB plus one mice. And I actually think this is the primary uh, mechanism underlying this rescue effect. We did measure different proteostasis components, mostly by Western blotting and immunostainings. And uh, we looked at lysosomal or autophagy markers. Uh, we looked at chaperon expression. Certain chaperons were highly induced by mutant ubiquitin, both in cell models and in animals. Uh, for example, that's 1433 zeta and some of these regulatory uh, chaperons. We did not see an induction of autophagy markers, for example, in the uh, brain tissues from these animals, but we only looked at it with blots for a couple of autophagy markers. We didn't do uh, any kind of reporter system for autophagy or lysosome uh, acidity or anything like that. And I think what's most likely to explain this effect of mutant ubiquitin, this adaptive proteostasis, is many uh, changes at low levels. So I think if you would look into these mice with uh, comparative transcriptomics or proteomics approaches, we would probably see that uh, there's an induction of other proteostasis pathways at mild levels that together result in a rescue effect. And actually there's a recent paper by uh, Dina Petranovic in Sweden, who mostly studies mutant ubiquitin in yeast. And there they see that indeed mutant ubiquitin uh, upregulates 
many different components of the lysosomal pathway uh, all at very mild levels. So if you would do blood, you only see mild changes. I have some to markers. interrupt you. We have to move on to the next opponent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Walter. Uh, the next opponent is uh, Professor David Wilson. He is Professor of Neuroscience at Hasselt University in Hasselt, Belgium. Professor Wilson. <clears throat> yeah, I, I also want to uh, echo some of the sentiments that have already been expressed. Um, I found your thesis uh, really enjoyable to read, uh, particularly the introduction. I thought it was quite elegant and thoughtful, and I, I really appreciated your historical perspective that you brought to the, to the, to the content. Um, you also should be congratulated on your excellent contribution, so uh, thank you to you and your team and your colleagues. Um, my questions are going to revolve around three primary topics. Uh, the first one is uh, this uh, process that you've already discussed a little bit, this molecular uh, misreading. So what I'd like to know a little bit more about is what is known about the underlying mechanisms. Why does this transcriptional error or purposeful event occur? And um, are, are there protein components that are involved in suppressing or regulating this? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, regarding the molecular misreading, uh, we see in different assays that molecular misreading, so these transcript errors or these frame shifts that occur in certain repeat motifs, are a universal feature in our genome. They're not the only factor in causing these abnormal RNA molecules. So we distinguish uh, molecular misreading from a broader transcript error mechanism. And there's many different factors that are found to control this. So whereas the monotonic repeat motifs, they're highly slippery for the polymerase. Uh, we see that there's different factors that can contribute. There can be stochastic factors, truly stochastic factors in which there's random errors on certain uh, bases. Uh, but there's also uh, protein components that regulate it. So for example, RNA polymerase two, the primary polymerase that makes uh, messenger RNAs, it has this proofreading domain. And uh, there's certain mutations in the RNA polymerase that also make the polymerase more or less error prone. It's the same for DNA polymerases. Uh, and interestingly, for RNA polymerases, people have not looked in that much detail at different variants which are more or less, which have more or less fidelity. Uh, and we do find that there are certain mutations, even in uh, patients with certain uh, developmental disorders, that make the RNA polymerase more or less error prone. And I think the most important factor, besides these uh, genomic hotspots, so these repeat motifs, are both other type of genome changes. So the genome is a highly structured uh, molecule. Uh, and we find that the conformation, so there's these uh, projects like the ENCODE project, project with MAP uh, in different types of human stem cells, for example, how the genome is organized at certain regions. And we redo our error measurements with sequencing-based assays. We see that the genome structure matters a lot. And probably, besides the monotonic repeats, the most important factor is uh, DNA damage. And it's surprising that, well, maybe because the technology has not been around for a very long time, uh, we see that DNA damage can actually substitute for other bases. So just like, uh, during DNA replication, uh, mutants, mutations can be introduced. Also, modified bases by damage uh, can be misread by the polymerase consistently. Uh, and what we see in single cell sequencing assays we modified uh, is that if you introduce certain lesions, which look very much like native bases, for example, there's a lesion called O6-methylguanine. It's also repaired by the specific enzyme MGMT. Um, we see that it kind of causes repetitive errors on these lesions. So as long as the error is not repaired, uh, the same abnormal molecule can be uh, uh, produced over and over again, generating a pool of identical mutant molecules. And we think that together with this molecular misreading uh, can cause a, a constant supply of abnormal, potentially amyloid and prion-like uh, molecules. And uh, so besides DNA mutations be being a base consequence of DNA damage. Also, this induction of uh, transcript mutations should be considered. And I think specifically for the repeat motives, these are constant hotspots. So we see in young, old animals, we see that the repeat motives, they constantly produce a about 100-fold higher 
uh, our output uh, yeah. steady state. Yeah. So do you know in repair mutant backgrounds, do you see elevation in some of these misreading events? Yes, we didn't do that in MGMT uh, uh, knockout animals or CRISPR-Off models or something like that. Uh, in yeast, there's a homolog called MGT1. Uh, and we did do DNA damaging treatments on MGT1. Uh, and we do see that whereas uh, DNA mutations do not occur in non-cycling cells because they cannot replicate, they do not make mutations, we see that there's an enormous increase in uh, error rates and it's uh, uh, time dependent uh, on, on the actions of MGT1. But when we remove the MGT1 enzyme, you see that the base keeps putting out this abnormal. Yeah, it's interesting. So there are, of course, a whole class of DNA repair syndromes, and it would be interesting to see if UBB plus one is actually upregulated in some of these cases and potentially contributing some of the neurological abnormalities that's seen in those cases. So com coming back to the UBB plus one, obviously that's one of the gene targets, but I presume there are others that are popularly errored. And I'm curious to, has there been an evaluation of the contribution of some of these other factors, kind of getting back to the specificity of whether or not UBB plus one is the pathogenic agent in this case? Yes, that's a really great point because the, this molecule was specifically identified by Dr. Van Leeuwen in the 90s because there was a clear functional implication of ubiquitin. The ubiquitin system had just been uh, uncovered, so to say. Uh, but there were also other proteins that contained these same frame shifts. And actually the APP protein, this uh, amyloidogenic uh, protein, uh, was also found to contain these frame shift variants. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, Dr. Van Leeuwen looked at this specifically with uh, antibodies that were generated against these frame shift forms. But of course, it would be incredibly laborious if you would have to generate specific antibodies against each variant. And I think only with recent consensus based sequencing approaches, people have been able to look at other sequences. And we do see. Uh, that whereas these errors occur constantly and they constantly occur in different types of molecules, uh, the ones that are most affected by it are these amyloidogenic or prion-like mm. proteins. And it's very interesting, and it comes back to your first uh, question, is because if you look in these error-prone mutants, they actually have these proteostasis uh, abnormalities. So if you make a yeast cell or a human cell with an error-prone polymerase, it makes these aggregates. And we're mm. quite surprised by it because we would have expected the view in the field is kind of that these errors are transient, so how could they ever affect biology? But if they would generate a pool of these amyloid or prion-like molecules, they might be able to sustain themselves because some of these might have self-replicating uh, uh, capacities, but definitely the aggregates can be populated by these epithelial. Yeah, it's very interesting finding this connection between repair and this potential of disrupted proteostasis. It sounds like a whole field that can be pursued independently. Um, so the second topic I wanted to get to is related to the disease specificity, and I think you very, very nicely described the genetic connections uh, of UPS defects with neurodegenerative diseases. But as you know, there are many genes involved in the UPS response. Um, and I'm wondering of whether or not mutations in some of these genes do not give rise to neurodegenerative disease, but perhaps give rise to other pathological events. Uh, definitely. So for example, in some You may give a short response, please. Uh, a specific example is the class of the ubiquitinating enzymes. So these are enzymes that remove ubiquitin or ubiquitin chains from other ubiquitins. And where some of these can lead to neurodegenerative issues like UCHL1, which we also found to accumulate in some of these diseases, some of them give rise to completely different disorders like neurodevelopmental, it's also like angel man syndrome, some of these disorders that are caused by mutations in dubs that don't have clear neurodegenerative uh, components. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and so, uh, uh, kind of coming back to the UBB plus one. And but we have, we have to move on. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize it had been nine minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, yeah. uh, Professor Wilson. Okay. Um, the next opponent is uh, Professor Pilar Martinez, and she is Professor of Neuroinflammation and Neuropsychiatric Di Disorders at Maastricht University. Professor Martinez. Thank you, dear Prorector. Um, I would like first to congratulate the candidate with a very nice uh, PhD thesis and also the promotion team. And my questions, uh, because you answered already many things, I would like to focus a little bit in chapter four. So recapitulating what you did there. So you use a transgenic animal which uh, overexpress UBB plus one and is under the control of the prion uh, protein promoter. 
I was wondering, when you uh, overexpress the UVB plus one, do you expect it to be only in neurons, or do you expect also to be in other cells of the brain? So that will be the first question, because uh, I am not certain then what you will expect. In this specific, highly esteemed opponent, in this specific case, um, there's a CAMK2 alpha promoter for the UB plus one mice, so you would expect only neuronal expression. There is a prion promoter in the APPPS1 mice, where we would also expect expression in glial cells, for example. Uh, yes, uh, but in the CAMK2 alpha model, the UB plus one transgenic mice, we would only express, ex expect expression in the neuronal cells. Okay, and uh, recapitulating the first findings you had regarding the UVB plus one mutant, was this specifically found only in neurons or in the brain in general? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the question... So it was the UVB plus one mutant uh, findings uh, initial by Dr. Van Leuven, yeah. Professor Van Leuven, found only in neurons, so were this general in the brain? We also find them in other cells, so okay. they're also present in astrocytes specifically, not so much in Alzheimer's disease, where we see that uh, the pattern of mutant ubiquitin pathology follows primarily a tauopathy, uh, which is an intraneuronal or intracellular pathology as compared to uh, the A-beta plugs. Uh, and we do see that there are certain diseases with ast astrocytic tau inclusions, like uh, a mm -hmm. PSP. So there are more cells. Uh, yes. Initially, in the initial discovery, more cells were involved. Now it comes to the point. So if I will be now asking professor, uh, a professor in, in New, York, New York University, which is only doing lysosomal investigations, she will tell me that it's all about the lysosomes. And you come here and tell me that it's all about the, the proteasome and errors in the proteasome. So can you, after some years uh, looking into your thesis, tell me, so what do you think? So you think we should consider only one of these mechanisms, the culprit, because you are in favor of a disease phenotype because of this UV plus one, or is it just a normal phenomenon which all the uh, pathways are involved, also the exosomal, uh, uh, so sec secreting exosomes could also be part of this mechanism? Yes, this is a question that comes back all the time because people have dedicated their lives or careers to either studying the proteasome or lysosomal systems. I think it's uh, neither totally. I think it's actually ubiquitin itself or ubiquitin signaling itself because what people often fail to realize, um, and it's something also in my introduction, I indicated ubiquitin as a signaling factor for the proteasome, but ubiquitin does a lot of other things in cells. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, I think most cell biological functions have been ascribed to at least be affected by ubiquitin to some extent. So ubiquitin actually also controls trafficking to the lysosome and oh. controls lysosome fusion. Uh, and I think... Uh, okay, uh, just sorry to interrupt. So if you think it's more about ubiquitin, but for example, in the brain, if you look to the brain and you mainly focus in protein degradation, but the most abundant species in the brain are not proteins, are lipids. Then I was wondering, uh, lipid degradation happens also via the lysosomal uh, pathway, and also lipids are very secreted via extracellular vesicles as one of the ways to also get rid of them when you cannot degrade uh, them well. So then I, I am wondering if you really focus in proteins as the main culprit, so what happens with the lipids then? Yeah, so lipid biology is like this big emerging uh, field in neurodegenerative disease. And I know that lipids definitely get degraded by lysosomal, or turned over by lysosomal pathways. Uh, and where the proteasome would fit in there is not uh, immediately clear. But uh, whereas the proteasome has been traditionally viewed as a well, machine that degrades monomeric proteins or very small proteins, uh, there's emerging evidence that the proteasome can actually uh, degrade larger structures and not degrading by putting them into their chamber and hydrolytic activities, but can actually chop up uh, fragments of larger molecules. So, so you stay with your idea that uh, ubiquitin is the, the core of it, and it's a very enthusiastic idea in uh, defense of your, of your PhD thesis, but now I want to bring it a, a step further. So you are having this misread, so UBB plus one, right? So this is happening, as you say, it's not random, so it has it, it, it may be random or not, but it has a disease, uh, has an effect in the disease. Now, I, I was wondering if you have looked to the polymerases that might make more possible that this UV plus one is generated. So maybe there is a change in the regulation of this uh, 
on this uh, polymerase is that will make this transcript to happen. And if that will be the case, this might be region specific of the brain, because as you see, your effects are not everywhere, but only in some special regions. So is this not maybe about the regulation of the mRNA uh, transcription? Uh, yes, so this comes back to whether uh, this is random, random or not. Uh, we do see that a different genomic uh, organization, also epigenetic factors, for example, uh, they can determine the error rates on certain parts of the genome. We don't know whether this is true for these monotonic repeats because they constantly put out an enormous amount of errors. And we did measure uh, error rates on these monotonic repeats, also in error-prone mutants. Uh, also looking at different uh, yeah. effects of genome organization, and we don't see that effect on these monotonic repeat. Uh, okay, so just one point. I think it will be very interesting to analyze the same, but in other cell types. I, I think because, like, for example, microglia also have to degrade a lot of proteins that, or a uh, rest of proteins, debris and uh, cellular damage uh, cells during uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So I think it will be very interesting to analyze that also in microglia. But I would like to go to your uh, statement now number 10, yeah. where you mentioned, uh, maybe you can uh, read it to us, uh, or your paranymph could read it to us, uh, Denise. <laughs> uh, statement number 10. Number 10. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, biology is inherently messy. We need clear thinking to understand its mysteries. So could you explain us why did you come to this statement uh, as very important? <laughs> yes, so I think, I think in, in uh, the field of different diseases, people have looked at gene mutations, some environmental factors as causative of disease. But I think there's this big unexplored region of uh, biology mm -hmm. uh, that all resolves, resolves around biosynthetic uh, errors because any uh, process any enzymatic process uh, will always result in a certain uh, amount of errors, also during uh, translation of messenger RNAs, uh, just like for transcription. Uh, and I think uh, this whole area of biology has been largely invisible because people on one hand didn't really care about this. They were only interested in finding out how frequently something works. They were obviously not immediately interested in how frequently something does not work. Um, but I think uh, these errors will become a more dominating factor in biology, and especially in neurodegenerative diseases, where there's often no identifiable cause. I think these yeah. molecular errors, if they result in prion-like behavior or amyloid yeah, behavior. Yeah, I was thinking uh, when I read this statement for me, this was meaning more in the sense that biology is very difficult to know certain that you are right. So there is a lot of room for high, for uh, arguing whether it's right or not, while if you look to physics or chemistry or mathematics, you always know that it's correct. So when you have an equation and the result is there, you know that this is the right answer, and in biology, not. So I will, I had interpreted your statement in this way, you know, so that in biology, nothing, you are never certain. Is maybe next year somebody tells you everything you thought it was wrong, and now we know, you know, that has uh, our idea of biology might change next year. Thank you for your, uh, for your answers, and I give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you, uh, Professor Martinez, and thank you for being the Secretary of this degree committee. Um, the opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Laurence Nijs. She is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Neuropsychology at Maastricht University. Dr. De Nijs. Yeah, so dear candidate, I would like first to congratulate you for this nice thesis. I really enjoyed reading it. And it's very nice to see uh, a thesis with all published papers. Um, and I would like also to uh, congratulate your promotion team. Um, I have a question related to the fact that, that you uh, described that UBB plus one could be used as a potential biomarker uh, in patients. But you mentioned that because it's only mostly present within the cells, that it's probably not being able to be measured in liquid biopsies. So uh, regarding recent advancement in technologies that found out that uh, extra extracellular vesicles can carry some protein content and be retrieved in, in biofluids and could be used as biomarker, and the fact that, for example, A-beta can be also uh, detected in those extracellular vesicles, I would like to ask you your point of view, or did you change your mind now, and, and could you see this as a potential use to detect uh, UBB plus one in, in blood, for example? Highly esteemed opponent. 
I definitely think uh, UB Reap is one has biomarker potential. And I think there's basically two or three uh, lines of work that recently led to uh, uh, increasing evidence that UB Reap one can be used as a biomarker. And the first is that uh, we looked at different secretion routes for UB Reap one from cells. And we find that it's not specifically normal extracellular vesicles, but there's an atophagosome-like secretion pathway in cells. Uh, it's called MOPS, um, uh, that specifically uh, ejects UB plus one molecules from cells. So there is definitely a secretion in cellular systems. Also, just like for some other abundant molecules in neurons, like UCHL1, this ubiquitinating enzyme, that can be measured in CSF or liquor uh, samples just because of the damage of uh, neurons that are being uh, degraded uh, is released into the uh, uh, liquor, uh, totally so you can measure that in liquor samples, uh, for example, with proteomics approaches or mass spectrometry. Um, and something we've started looking into is looking at uh, antibodies or patient about antibodies against these mutant ubiquitin species because they're basically non-native uh, ubiquitin proteins, like they don't resemble the wild-type ubiquitin. There's actually also an immune response from patients even to low levels of these mutant molecules. And we do find autoantibodies against uh, mutant ubiquitin and also other protein variants in patient uh, blood samples. Uh, so we also think those might be uh, useful as a biomarker. So you, you indeed nicely mentioned that it could be useful as a biomarker, but uh, given the fact that it has been found to be present in several neurodegenerative disorder, so how do you see the clinical relevance of using it? Do you see it as a general biomarker of neurodegeneration or more at specific Alzheimer's disease or uh, other type of neurodegenerative disorders? Yes, I would definitely see it only as a marker for the specific disease that has been identified in. You cannot, or you, I wouldn't expect to be able to differentiate Alzheimer's disease from other neurodegenerative disease in which UB plus one accumulates. But I think with uh, therapies becoming available for certain neurodegenerative disorders, I think there's a need for markers that will allow you to longitudinally follow uh, progression of the disease or the impact of treatments. And if the ubiquitin system is a key player in disease progression, I think measuring this mutant ubiquitin could also be used as such a longitudinal uh, marker. Thank you. So I have another question that follow up uh, a previous discussion about the misreading uh, and the, the, the production of the UBB1 uh, protein. So you nicely described several mechanisms, but you didn't talk about epigenetic mechanisms. So I would like to have your vision. Do you think epigenetic mechanisms could also play a role in the production of that uh, uh, specific protein and that could explain the heterogeneity that you can find also in, in different disorder and, and cell type? Yes, so we did do error measurements by consensus sequencing of different errors, not specifically for the ubiquitin variant, but for all kinds of errors uh, that occur. And we do see that epigenetic factors play an important role. And it's mostly the uh, confirmation of the genome that plays a role in how actively uh, genes are transcribed. And we do see that the more often a gene is transcribed, the more errors will be introduced. And that I think ultimately comes down to a sort of evolutionary trade-off between the speed and fidelity of uh, the enzymes. And that's true for any type of biological reaction, I think, that they don't just need to be accurate for life to uh, be sustained, but also need to be fast enough. Uh, and I think there's a trade-off because you see for different types of polymerase, also DNA polymerases, the higher fidelity they have, the slower they uh, are. So. Uh, we definitely think that uh, the activity state of the genome or how actively it's inscribed, or we can measure that, uh, results in different amounts of errors or different error rates. So that's also where these methylation factors come into play, for example. Yeah, and uh, if I can have a, a last question regarding uh, the different uh, semi-quantitative uh, uh, um, measurements you did all over the different chapters. So I, I wonder why you just did some semi-quantitative measurement and why didn't apply a more quantitative measurement of the presence of different uh, antibodies and how you could be um, uh, to assess the, the accuracy of the measurement uh, you did by highs uh, on the different expression level, also on the density of, of the, the different cells expressing those, uh, those uh, proteins. Yes, so uh, 
it's not discussed in the thesis. We did do other types of measurements like Western blots on Alzheimer's disease patient brains and controls, which are a bit more quantitative. Uh, we also recently were able to detect UBPS1 with MOSPEC in different samples, which I think is an ideal way to do it, especially approaches like SRM uh, proteomics. Uh, I think that's currently the gold standard in detecting rare uh, protein variants in uh, patient samples, also like splice variants of certain proteins, for example. Uh, and we do see that we can specifically detect UBPS1. We didn't do it for uh, this Guamanian disease, for example, this ALS PDC syndrome, mostly because the tissue samples were just too scarce. So whereas most brain banks will have plenty of tissues from different Alzheimer's cases and controls, uh, these diseases have kind of become uh, extinct, uh, so to say, so they don't occur at high incidences anymore. And we had to base our uh, analysis on archival specimens uh, for this analysis. So it's mostly scarcity of the tissues, which causes us to focus on one. Yes, Mr. Verheyen, I think you have noticed that the time for defending your thesis has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and in particular the quality of your defense. And please await our return with the results of our deliberation. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the
ze één print per dag later hadden gedaan, dat heeft ze niet deze week gehad. Oh. Maar, dat moet niet. Ja, gelukkig wel. Maar je weer op. Mr. Lambertus for Heer. Um, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of this positive verdict, and of course taking into account your previous qualifications, the committee has uh, decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Steinboos is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom and law. And I invite now your supervisors to take the floor. Professor Steinbosch. Oké. Okay. Ik ga terug in het Nederlands. Het is ook goed voor je moeder en het is goed voor je vader. Zo, dat is een little bit. En I hope our guest also have the opportunity then to learn a little bit Dutch. Geachte, maar ik mag het niet zeggen volgens mij, want dit is pas officieel dokter. Had je dit bulk gegeven? Ja, dit is zo'n zo, zo grensvlak. Mr. Verheijer, geachte heer Verheijer, belooft u dat u altijd volgens de beginselen van de wetenschappelijke integriteit te werk zult gaan? Eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk. Ja, dat beloof ik. Mooi. Krachtens de bevoegdheid ons door de wet toegekend, volgens het besluit van de commissie hier tegenwoordig, verklaar ik, verklaar ik hierbij u, Lambertus Marie Verheijer, tot dokter te bevorderen en u alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens de wet zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhandig ik u nu de bul door rector, secretaris en overige leden van de promotiecommissie ondertekend en met het grootzegel van onze universiteit bevestigd. Gaan we nu verder met een uh, laudatio en ik doe het rustig aan, want ik, het kan zijn dat ik wat kuch, maar uh, dan neem ik een glasje water. Beste Mark, ik heb de laatste dagen daar eens over kunnen nadenken, want ik was wat bedlegerig, maar het is ook een, goed, een, een goede gelegenheid om eens wat dingen te reflecteren. Het heeft lang geduurd, maar zoals altijd, zou ik willen zeggen, telt alleen het eindresultaat en minder de weg ernaartoe. Ja? Ik wil het toch op deze ochtend iets zeggen over jouw specifieke weg, die ik toch zou willen omschrijven als lang, hobbelig en bochtig. En ik ga dat allemaal toelichten laten, Denise. Ons gezamenlijke reis begon in mei 2012. Dat was de tijd dat professor Hopkins jaarlijks voor drie maanden naar Maastricht kwam. Dat had ik zo georganiseerd destijds als directeur, waarbij hij een sabbatical deed hier. En tijdens dat sabbatical um, van drie maanden werkte hij altijd samen met... Fred Verleeuwen. En Fred Verleeuwen, die uit het herseninstituut naar Maastricht was gekomen. En Fred, als een echte neuroanatoom, samen met, uh, uh, met Dick Swaap, was helemaal gevestigd op het ubicatin proteasoon systeem en wilde dat verder gaan ontwikkelen. En hij was op zoek naar studenten. En hij kon geen studenten vinden, want alle studenten die wilden heel graag werken op het gebied van molecular biology. En als je zegt, je gaat werken aan een microscoop, dan was iedereen afgehakt. Dan zei ze, no way, geen interesse in. Ik ga niet met microscoop werken. Maar jij, jij was degene die zei, graag. En je zei, ik ga best werken en ik wil best door die microscoop kijken. Ik wil uren door die microscoop kijken en ik wil, ik wil dingen vastleggen. En in dat opzicht was je al destijds 
een uitzonderlijke, wat ik zou zeggen, een uitzonderlijke student. En met z'n drieën, Fred, jij en David, zaten uren bij elkaar koepers te bekijken, koepers te bediscussiëren, te vergelijken, Alzheimer, postmortem, zijn uh, muisproeven, en, et cetera. En ik vond dat toen al, uh, <coughs> ik vond dat toen al uh, uitdagend voor jou. Ik dacht van, nou, hij is wel een volthoudend. Wat ik heb kunnen doen in die tijd was natuurlijk ook dat ik ook zag dat er een, een financiële nood was. Dus we gaven je je eerste studentassistentschap. Dat je zei van, uh, ik weet het nog goed, 500 euro per maand. Ja, dus daar, kon je dus, daar kon je dus een tijdje wat, uh, wat mee doen. Net zoals ik al heb gezegd, 2012, het was uh, niet de tijd voor anatomie, het was de tijd voor moeilijke leren neurobiologie. Het was de tijd van systems biology, het was de opkomst van epigenetics. En absoluut niet met anatomy en, en publicaties op dat gebied. Je was een van de weinige mensen die dat heeft gedaan. En daarna ben je in 2013 ben je afgestudeerd met je master in, uh, <coughs> sorry, met je master in biomedische wetenschappen aan onze universiteit. Ik heb daarna, <coughs> ik denk dat we dat toch kunnen noemen. Ik heb daarna goed kunnen regelen voor je dat je begonnen bent met een... een Eerste PhD, een andere PhD. Ik noem hem toch even. Ik ga dat niet uit de weg. En dat was destijds in, uh, in Utrecht bij Jeroen Pasterkan, een oud ario van mij, die ondertussen uh, directeur daar is geworden. En daar ben je gestart. Nou, die, po die positie die heb je drie jaar aan gewerkt. Uh, er ging van alles mis, maar daar gaan we vandaag niet over praten. De conclusie was: op een gegeven ben je daarmee gestopt. En je bent vertrokken naar San Diego. Op een bepaalde manier. Samen met Fred, kan ik me in die periode, dat was de jaar 2015-16, hebben we deelgenomen aan de Society for Neuroscience in San Diego. Ja, ik, ik organiseerde toen al daar de zogenaamde Alzheimer Fast Track Meetings. En dit jaar is, dit jaar is ons 25-jarig jubileum ervoor. Je presenteerde je eerste poster. Had ik een foto gehad, had ik die vandaag hier op het scherm gepresenteerd voor jou. Met vol trots. En uh, we verbleven samen met z'n allen in het, in het Holiday Inn in uh, in, uh, uh, hoe heet het, Mission Valley, voor de mensen die daar vertrouwd zijn. Tijdens je Utrechtse periode, dat is dus die periode daarna geweest, had je een parallel project met Fred en David. En dan ben je blijven werken aan het ubiquitum proteasoomsysteem, omdat je dat eigenlijk super interessant vond. Dat is achteraf een gevaar geweest, maar goed, dat is, uh, dat is nauw gelopen. Je bent er gestopt in Utrecht, begeerlijk. En je bent overgegaan naar die positie die je kon krijgen, in, uh, in, uh, die je hebt gezocht in, uh, in de UCSD, de University of California in San Diego, in de afdeling gerontologie. En daar heb je een aantal jaren gewerkt met, met succes. Je, blend, uh, je bent met Fred blijven doorwerken. Uh, er zijn een groot aantal papers verschenen in 2015 <coughs> en in 2018. En op een gegeven moment is, uh, is dat gestopt. Fred kreeg prostaatkanker en is overleden. Wat jammer was. Heel plotseling. Dit ging maar heel snel. Ik heb toen nog met Fred gesproken. Uh, ook vlak voor zijn dood. En we voelden toen toch als een plicht om jou te brengen naar een PhD. Ik heb die taak overgenomen. En ik, ik wilde dat ook laatst brengen. Ik wilde dit project tot een goed einde brengen. En samen, wij met z'n tweeën, hebben we vervolgens op de tafel gezeten in 19 en in 20. Uh, wat hebben we nu eigenlijk? Wat hebben we nou in data? Wat hebben we nu aan harde data? En waar kunnen we daar een proefschrift van maken? En wat missen we nog? Wat moeten we bijschrijven? Waar, moeten we, waar zijn die jaten? Nou, dat, uh, die, die eindjes hebben we allemaal bij elkaar gepakt. En um, in het begin vond ik het moeilijk om met je samen te werken. Ik zeg het maar eerlijk. Um, je had voortdurend een tweede agenda. En ik kende die niet, maar ik wist dat die er was. En ik dacht van... Um, en je vond die, die PhD... Ja, moet dat nou zo nodig nog? Ja, ik heb toch al een postdoc-positie. In, uh, in de overal en het gaat, het gaat eigenlijk best wel lekker. Ja? Tot eigenlijk uh, duidelijk werd, en toen vielen eigenlijk de dubbeltjes uh, de goede kant uit, dat ook in Amerika, ook in Harvard, ook in uh, San Diego gezegd werd, uh, ja, je krijgt bij ons een postdoc-positie en die heb je ook, maar er zit wel een klein, uh, een, bij de kleine letters staat duidelijk geschreven, PhD within two years, finished. Ja, dus er was een hele, plotseling kwam er een hele sterke druk. 
je moet wel een PhD hebben om door te gaan. Je kunt zo niet doorgaan uh, dat op een gegeven moment uh, stopt dat. Mensen zeggen dat, we willen niet meer. En toen hebben we eigenlijk besloten, nu gaan we alle kracht bij elkaar zetten. We gaan het helemaal uitschrijven en we gaan het indienen enzovoort. We zoeken de commissie. En toen ging eigenlijk alles heel snel. En toen heb ik het ook heel constructief ervaren dat we veel overleg hebben gehad. Uh, soms wel eens wekelijks overleg, dat we zeggen van we moeten bij elkaar zitten. En ik heb voortdurend moeten drammen, zijn de hoofdstukken af. Dat moet worden bijgeschreven enzovoort. En dat ging toen goed. Toen was plossing, heb ik hier gezegd, alle aandacht terug... En we hebben samen in een korte termijn, de laatste zes tot acht maanden, de thesis afgerond. En natuurlijk hebben we ook heel veel geoefend op de presentaties. Tot gisterochtend toe we hebben we nog de laatste keer nog een keer wat dia's veranderd. Maar je doel is bereikt. Je bent PhD. En de weg staat eigenlijk open om alles te gaan doen wat je zo graag wilde als postdoc. Ja. Uh, je hebt een, een goed proefschrift geleverd. En ik kan wel zeggen vanuit de commissie, een uitstekend proefschrift. En je hebt het ook vandaag met verve verdedigd op diezelfde rustige manier zoals je altijd presentaties doet. Niet gehaast, maar daar ben je al te mature voor. Daar ben je al te veel postdoc voor, wil ik zelfs zeggen. En te weinig PhD voor. Israël, denk ik, is nu even een moeilijke periode om daar naartoe te gaan. Dat lijkt me haast uh, niet echt doenlijk, al weet ik. <coughs> ja. <coughs> al weet ik niet in, uh, Technion is niet een deel van, volgens mij, van, uh, van Weisman. Het is, het is een Haifa, volgens mij. En Haifa is heel rustig. Ja, dus uh, dat is een goede plek. Maar dit, Israël werd ook gezien om een, als een tussenperiode voor mogelijke wijze de baan in, uh, in, uh, in Boston. Maar ik zou je toch ook willen adviseren, en ik kijk even naar mijn collega hier. Misschien hoef je helemaal niet zo ver weg te gaan. Misschien is er ook wel iets in Hasselt. Misschien is er ook wel iets in Aken. Misschien is er ook iets in de Uiregio. Dus, en daar hebben we het over gehad. Dus zoek het niet te ver weg. Het is helemaal niet nodig. Ja? Jouw liefde voor de, het ubicatine proteosoomsysteem staat, blijft, is genetisch bij jou vastgelegd. En dat is geen mutatie. Dat is gewoon volgens mij iets epigenetisch wat er bij je helemaal vast is gelegd. Ik wens je eigenlijk uh, voor de komende periode alles goeds. Ik dank je voor de, de jarenlange samenwerking. Ik ben super blij dat je nu eigenlijk dit kunt afronden. Ik ben ook blij dat we hebben het kunnen afronden voor Fred. Ja? We hebben ook zijn vrouw hier een, uh, een boekje gestuurd. En ik wil in mijn dankwoord ook betrekken natuurlijk David Hopkins. Die had hier vandaag aanwezig willen zijn. De tickets waren geboekt. Hey, dat is ook een kleine anekdote. De, de tickets waren geboekt. Uh, maar zijn vrouw is uh, vier dagen geleden gevallen. In Halifax of gevallen. Het regende erg en ze is uitgegleden op straat en ze is met haar hoofd op een stoeprand gekomen en ze heeft een, hersen, een, hoe heet dat, een hersenschudding. En hij vond het veel om haar alleen te laten. Hij zei, ik kan niet komen, dus ik, heb dat, ik zeg dat af. Online, ik ben wel online. Ik zeg, nee David, je bent niet online. Want online betekent voor jou vier uur s'nachts. Ja, dat is, je moet even denken. Dus, uh, en je bent geëxcuseerd. Dus David, David zullen we nog een aparte bedankje apart sturen. Goed. <coughs> Dit gezegd hebben, dan wil ik dan ook danken uh, de leden van de commissie voor de prachtige vragen. Ik vond echt mooie vragen die gesteld werden. En de vragen die jij dan ook toch goed oppikte om een keer overview over het veld te geven. Niet heel gespecifieke vragen, maar mooie vragen. Ik wil in mijn geluk wens natuurlijk ook betrekken je ouders die hier aanwezig zijn. Je moeder als parenimf. Ja. <coughs> je, je vader als enige toehoorder. Ja, dat is ook een belangrijke taak. <coughs> en daarmee wil ik eigenlijk graag, uh, graag afsluiten. Ik geef daarbij het woord terug aan uh, de pro-rector. Dankjewel, uh, Harry, voor je mooie woorden. Um, zeer geleerde uh, dokter Verheij, beste Mark. Um, ik zal mijn, uh, mijn felicitaties uh, in, gedeeltelijk in het Nederlands uitspreken, maar ook gedeeltelijk in het Engels. Uh, ik begin met te zeggen dat het me heel groot genoeg is je van harte te feliciteren met het behaalde doctoraat. En ik uh, breng die felicitatie natuurlijk ook over namens de Universiteit Maastricht. And now I change to English because I would like to share with you some impressions of the committee. And What we have seen is, first of all, a, an excellent presentation, very clear, which explains very well, I think also for, for lay people, 
what has been going on in your in your studies and and what you have found. Um, we have seen that uh, you have delivered a, um, a thesis of very good quality, well written. Um, it's also well published in high quality journals. And you have shown with that that you are mastering the subject of your studies. And with respect to your defense, we have seen that you addressed the questions very well, but also elaborative. And as, as, as Professor Steinbuch said, the questions were of a, of a higher level than just the occasional findings in the thesis, but they they addressed, let's say, the general aspects of the of the uh, of the thesis. Um, so you have answered and you have defended your uh, your thesis in an excellent way, and uh, we are very satisfied with with your responses. Um, and. Uh, I would like to uh, congratulate, of course, also your two supervisors, uh, Professor Harry Steinbusch and Dr. David Hopkins. It's, it's sad that we, he, he has not, he's not able to join us today in the, in the committee. Um, and natuurlijk wil ik ook graag in mijn felicitaties van harte betrekken uh, je vader, je moeder die ik op dit moment niet kan zien, maar die, ik, uh, ik, 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 ik feliciteer u van harte. En ook wil ik graag betrekken, ook in mijn felicitaties, de andere leden van de familie die hier niet zijn, maar die misschien wel het, uh, de verdediging hebben kunnen zien. En, en natuurlijk wil ik ook in mijn felicitatie betrekken uh, je collega's, je vrienden, uh, bekenden uh, en al degenen die op een of andere manier hebben uh, bijgedragen aan het tot stand komen van je proefschrift en de publicaties. I would like to thank all members of the committee, and in particular I would like to thank um, the external members of the committee. Uh, Maastricht University appreciates very much uh, your uh, contributions to in the way of critical reading the manuscript and having interesting questions here in the defense ceremony. And I would like to give the opportunity to Professor Jochen Walter, he is still online, and you, we can see him uh, on the screen. Um, and I would like to invite you to congratulate the young doctor. Yeah, dear Dr. Verheyen, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very elegant and uh, very interesting presentation. As already has been said, I, but all Committee members were very impressed of your uh, scientific work. So that's a great piece of work. And uh, I had the impression, but it was also clear, I think, in general, that you are really in this topic. You are uh, very much engaged in this project. So you live in science. So that's very nice. And I hope that you will continue and um, would stay in science, but I heard already that this is uh, planned. So that's great to keep you in, in science. And um, yeah, so congratulations again and all the best for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Walter. And uh, Mark, well, I would like to wish you a very successful professional career and a happy personal life. And then uh, we have come to an end of the ceremony and hereby I close this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. I would like to invite uh, the committee to stand with you in the middle uh, and we will make a... Recording stopped.